systematic inequalities and disparities, we encourage faculty use open educational resources as a tool for pedagogical reform of teaching, learning, and research materials. OER is a catalyst for innovation, providing students at no cost a learner-centered experience. So uh, this is supported all the way up to the top. And so if you're interested in OER, we know that we have their support as well. Okay. Thank you, President. Thank you, Vice President. And now our, um, our uh, keynote address is Una Daly. And Una is the director of the Community College Consortium for Open Educational Resources, a community of practice for open education celebrating <coughs> its 10th anniversary. CCCOER is a partner in achieving the DREAMS OER degree initiative and provides support for the California Zero Textbook Cost degree program. Previously, Una was OER Library Service Manager for the California Open Online Library. And prior to that, uh, was directing uh, CCOER. Uh, she led the College Open Textbooks Accessibility Professional <coughs> Development and College Grant Programs at the Foothill De Anza District. She holds a master's degree in education with a focus on e-portfolios and undergraduate studies and formerly was a software engineer. So please join in me in welcoming uh, uh, Una Daly. What right. are you on? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoopis. And um, can everyone hear me out there? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. And thank you very much to Dr. Bianca Roden Quince, who invited me to speak with you this morning. Um, and I understand that you're celebrating Open Education Week, which is really exciting. That is the global celebration of open education and its impact worldwide. We're celebrating the seventh year of that, uh, our seventh annual um, celebration, and it's, um, it changes a little every year. Uh, this year, we have 31 countries who have submitted either online events, resources, videos, um, or are holding local events on their campuses. So institutions from 31 countries representing 15 languages, the top three languages this year, and this is different this year, are English, Arabic, and Spanish. So uh, really exciting, uh, a real um, game changer in many ways. Okay, I talked a little bit about, uh, I'm sorry, Jim talked a little bit about me. Um, so I'll skip over that one. Um, I uh, want to tell you a little bit about uh, the Community College Consortium for OER. It was actually founded right here in the Bay Area 10 years ago at the Foothill De Anza Community College District. And Dr. Martha Cantor was the visionary. I think some of you may have may know her. Uh oh. Roger. Roger. No. 2007, when she envisioned open educational resources as a tool for community colleges. And prior to that, most of the work that was being done around open education was at the four-year uh, colleges and universities, particularly the private universities. So she really had a vision which aligns with the vision that Jim shared with us earlier from your president and vice president, that not only could it provide uh, faculty with choices around the content they use in their classroom, it could also be um, um, a catalyst for pedagogical innovation and development. And ultimately, of course, at the bottom of that is student success. Since that time, we've spread uh, throughout the United States. We have members in 28 states. We have 11 statewide members, of which, of course, California is a statewide member, and we have a number of individual college members. So, um, the right to education goes back at a very basic level around the world. UNESCO, which I think um, um, and open education really aligns with this, and UNESCO has been a huge. In fact, they are the ones that coined the word or opened up back in the early 2000s. And MIT, who is really um, 
they're really um, given uh, the, the, the recognition that they first, uh, in this sort of modern era of open education, were inspired to kick this off. And their faculty, uh, looking at the internet that had was fully developed in the early 2000s and looking at the ability to share their knowledge around the world, decided that they would put their entire undergraduate curriculum online so that learners around the globe could have access. And of course, people thought they were kind of crazy at the time. Um, but what they have found is that um, it attracted so many people to their to their uh, university. 50 million visitors have, from 200 countries have visited their site um, in the last 15 years when uh, it was first put up. Uh, but it's attracted amazing faculty and talented students to their doors. And out of that grew the Open Education Consortium, which CCCOER is part of, and it's hundreds of colleges um, and universities around um, the world um, committed to advancing open education and its impact globally. So you can see 40 countries, 29 languages. So enough about the big picture. I want to dig down on just a few details, and so I've got a little quiz for you. And uh, there's really no right and wrong answers here, but it's just, it's just for fun. So here's the first question. Are open educational resources in the public domain? True or false? Can I see a show of hands for true? Okay, so I saw a couple go up. How about false? <laughs> okay. All right, so this is kind of a trick question. Because, in fact, uh, open educational resources are teaching and learning resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under an intellectual property license that allow their free use and repurposing. This license is normally referred to as the Creative Commons license. Now, I would say 10 years ago when CCC OER was founded, far more of OER was in the public domain. We didn't have as much of this uh, user created um, educational resources that had been licensed under the Creative Commons license. So that's really what's changed in 10 years. So if you answered true or false, you were, uh, you were just fine. And here's an example. <laughs> so here's some examples of what these, this OER looks like. Um, some of you may be familiar familiar with the really wonderful OpenStax textbooks. Those are free online for students. They're available uh, in print copies uh, in a very affordable, modest fees. Um, and in fact, uh, one of those textbooks, um, I'm showing three here, but one of them, Introductory Statistics, was actually written by a community college faculty at De Anza College. Um, which is Dr. Barbara Alowski, and there was another faculty member, Susan Dean, who wrote that. And at De Anza College alone, in using that textbook over the last 10 years, it's gone through a number of adaptations, but it has been an open textbook for the last 10 years. They've saved their students millions of dollars. And I happen to know that some of your Skyline faculty have, have adopted this textbook, and I'm sure it are also achieving a lot of uh, savings for students. So really, OER is any tool, material, or technique, uh, including textbooks, to access knowledge freely. Uh, there's also free videos online that have a Creative Commons license, which means that you can bring them into your classroom, you can even edit them, and they're um, free to reuse. Lumen Learning is another company that uh, publishes open courses. All right, so last quiz question. By what percent have textbooks Price has risen since 2000. Okay, and show of hands, less than 50%. 50 to 75. Okay, good guess. Over 80. And actually, it is over 80. Um, I think many of you have probably seen this graph before. This is a little out of date. It's from 2002 through 2012, where you can see that college textbooks increased by 82% in that 10-year period. Uh, they haven't decreased in the last six years. They are not accelerating at the same rate that they were in the early 2000s. But um, it still is a problem. And what, what, what is it, what kind of problem is it causing for our students? Well, this survey is done every other year in Florida. Uh, the last one was done in 2016 with 22,000 university and community college students. It was primarily college students, but 
there were university students in this. Um, and what they found is that, and this, and I have to say this is, they're doing another one this year, but these numbers are pretty consistent year to year. They started the first one in 2010. So 67% of students did not purchase a required textbook at some point due to cost. 38% reported that they felt they earned a poor grade because of it. 20% reported that they failed a course because of not purchasing a textbook. And maybe even more dramatic is that 48%, almost half, reported that they occasionally or frequently took fewer courses because of the cost of textbooks. So it's clear that this is impacting students' ability to achieve their educational goals and complete in a timely manner. So how can open educational resources support students and teachers in helping them to be successful? So online access on the first day of class, free online and low cost print options. And because it has that open license, faculty can adapt for students. So what does that mean? You know, for many faculty who've taught in the classroom, and I myself have, the textbook's quite expensive. And you feel like you have to cover all the chapters because it was so darn expensive. When you're using an OER textbook, you use the chapters you need. They're free to students online. There's no requirement, no compulsion to, to cover chapters that aren't necessary simply to make it worth a student's cost. There's no requirement to change versions every few years based on the publisher's whim. You stick with it, you, you can update it, or you can go to an updated version if you choose to do so. You can customize it. And this is really a powerful piece um, because you know best what your students' needs are. And many of the open textbooks have ancillaries now, PowerPoints and test banks that you can use. So I want to mention um, just uh, some wonderful resources within California. The California Open Online Library um, was uh, kicked off in 2014, and it continues to be updated. It was a partnership between all three systems, uh, UC, CSU, and CCC. Uh, to provide open textbooks for the top 50 courses, the top 50 transfer courses. So um, it has peer reviews, accessibility reviews, and it's all listed by common course ID. So you can look up and, tr and find a textbook and read the peer reviews from the different faculty within our system about that if you're looking for a textbook for your course. So wonderful resource. Out of that uh, original legislation came the Affordability Textbook Act, Act uh, more fondly called AB 798. And these were grants that were allocated in uh, 2016 where colleges could apply for between $10,000 and $50,000 to um, convert their courses to use open textbooks. 23 community colleges in California were awarded those. And um, the savings so far as of December of 2017 uh, were quite impressive. The orange lines, I'm sorry, this is a little bit of a, a, an eye chart. The orange lines are the community colleges. The blue lines are the CSUs because, once again, this was a partnership. And as you can see, Pasadena College exceeded $600,000 in savings in that time frame. Uh, Butte Butte Glen Community College uh, got up to almost 400,000 in savings. And you can see there was great savings across the board. So now um, in the last year, we have kicked off in California and throughout the nation, I might add, um, what are called OER or Z degrees. And these are complete pathways of courses that have been converted to use OER or zero cost materials instead of traditional textbooks. So these are faculty converting their courses to use these open educational resources. So the goals around this is to provide this complete pathway, um, expand access for students and equity by making it lower cost and more accessible for students. It's also um, going to help with degree completion because if we go back and look at that survey, those students that had to, had to stop out, take fewer classes, won't be, won't, will not have that problem if they're in, enrolled in one of these Z degrees. Um, it provides faculty with a lot of different choices. It's an opportunity to enhance your pedagogy, to use all of these wonderful open educational resources and zero cost materials. And 
within California, we're growing this uh, repository of courses that will be available beyond the initial 23 colleges. So 23 colleges were awarded um, an implementation grant for the Z degree, including Skyline College which is really exciting. And you can see here are the, are the degree areas um, for the California um, grants. Uh, child development, by the way, was the top one. There are six colleges that are working on degrees for child development. Um, and you can, uh, and beyond that, um, there was, I think the really exciting thing here is that California had a lot of what we would call career technical education um, degrees slash certificates, which is unusual um, in, the, in the more national picture. So really looking at OER and workforce, and I, I'm really excited about that. I think that's a wonderful combination, is providing affordable training resources for workforce classes. And of course, respiratory care. Uh, Skyline is doing a full degree around that uh, for the Z degree. And you can see that there's a number of other um, career-related um, uh, degrees as well. Kinesiology, architectural tech, biology lab tech, precision algebra agriculture, excuse me, administration of justice, and then some wonderful gen ed um, business, business administration, communications, computer science, etc. And here are the colleges that are doing that. I, sorry, I probably, this is an interactive map. And um, the colleges uh, are all around uh, the state from um, up in the top there, which is Butte College, all the way down to Grossmont College in the south. But you can see uh, a pretty nice um, distribution of colleges working on this work. And um, as I said, uh, once again, all of the materials that are produced by this grant will have the Creative Commons license and they will be put into the professional learning network as well as in the um, California Open Online Library, which I showed you earlier. So that means that you as faculty within the community college system in California can look at those resources, you can adopt them, adapt them, them, bring them into your classroom as well. Um, I wanted to just give you a, a really quick, a few national um, data points as well. So Achieving the Dream um, is the uh, Community College Reform Network. Um, they work with a number of colleges in California um, and of course throughout the country, particularly with helping colleges that are working on uh, tough issues around student completion, um, etc. Uh, student learning outcomes. Um, a, a, a wonderful organization. And they kicked off the largest um, OER degree, and I use that term interchangeably, OER degree and Z degree. Uh, there are some slight differences, but they kicked off a national um, program uh, just about a year before California, and they are working with 38 colleges in 13 states. So this OER degree and Z degree work is really getting a lot of national prominence and there's there's a lot of um, promise and potential uh, for helping our students at the community colleges um, to be successful and we have two California colleges that are participating in that as well and that's Santa Ana College in Southern California and West Hill College Lemoore um, who are part of that program. I also wanted to give you a data point for one district in the United States. Now, this is a large district. They started adopting OER in their, um, at their colleges um, five years ago, and their goal was to save five million in five years. And they are just approaching the anniversary of their five-year program. They have saved their students, as you can see, uh, more than double their goal at 11,520,000. And they did it through uh, creating faculty awareness, providing uh, professional growth. There were uh, stipends for developing new courses using OER. And very importantly, they reached out to their students and created student awareness. Uh, they did focus groups. They um, provided um, information in the student information system, uh, which I know many of our colleges are doing right now too, so that students could search for OER courses or low-cost courses um, to help out with um, their needs. So, um, there's been a lot of success. Um, there's also been some research done, which I want to share with you. Um, so, um, th this research that I'm going to report to you um, has been done by the Open Education Group. They do a lot of the 
open education research um, within the United States. And what they've done is they've aggregated 21 different peer-reviewed studies of the efficacy of OER. And when I say efficacy, I mean um, the learning outcomes associated. So how did students do who were in OER courses versus students who were in courses with traditional textbooks? So it's a, it's a comparison of that sort of um, efficacy measure. And there were 167,000 or slightly over that students um, from the 21 peer reviewed um, um, studies and 95% of the students did the same or better in an OER course versus a traditional textbook. So we're finding that students are doing as well or better and yet they're saving so much money and we know that student debt is such a huge issue these days. Uh, so this is, this is a, a, a net positive. Um, also, I want to talk to you about perceptions of quality because this is often a question that comes up with OER. Is it as, is it, uh, as high a quality as the textbook um, that came from my publisher? And so they took 20 peer-reviewed studies of OER quality from both a faculty and student perspective. There was over 16,000 faculty and students involved. And the results came back that 55% said that the OER textbook was um, just about the same as the textbook publisher in terms of usability and um, working with their students. 35% actually said that OER textbook was better and 10% said that it was worse. So once again, a very promising result. Um, still early days, but um, we had a lot of um, different voices come into these. And finally, what, what we're using as a measure to look at student success uh, for OER is an aggregate uh, measure where we look at a combination of drop rates, withdrawal rates, and then pass rates. And this study is still fairly limited, is from Tidewater Community College um, in Virginia, which is a large community college in Virginia, but is still, you know, one college. They did their study over uh, 2014 and 16, and they found that their students uh, performed significantly better on their course throughput rate um, the students in taking an OER course than those of their peers who are in a traditional textbook class. And now once again, this is using that throughput rate, looking at drop rates, withdrawal rates, because we feel that we have seen evidence that students who are in classes where the textbook's available on day one and it's free, um, don't drop at the same rate. So they have a higher persistence rate. So if we look at that aggregate um, measure, it's very promising. All right, and that was published um, in a peer-reviewed journal as well. All right, that's all I really had today. I just wanted to mention to you that there's a, there's a big community out there. CCCOER has a community email list. Uh, Bianca's on it. Quite a number of people from Skyline College are on it. We'd love to have you on it. We do monthly webinars uh, featuring um, OER experts and practitioners in the field. We often have folks from California talking about their work. And um, if you're interested in finding out more about this, it's free to join. You just go to our website under community email and um, sign up and um, there's some wonderful conferences uh, to attend uh, of course there's a, a global international conference that's put on by my parent organization which is the open education consortium and it's in different uh, countries every year this year it's in the Netherlands um, so it'll be a wonderful uh, uh, celebration of open ed uh, the Open Education Conference, though, is a national conference held in the U.S. generally, sometimes in Canada, but this year it is in October and it will be in upstate New York. And it's a wonderful uh, three days of hearing about all of the projects going on around the world. And there's a, uh, sorry, around the country primarily. And there's a very uh, heavy community college attendance. So um, you'll get a chance to see it from both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Um, by the way, all of our webinars, our monthly webinars, are archived and they're available if you want to check those out. Uh, they're up on our website. So um, I um, encourage you to join in the conversation. Um, participate with CCCOER and um, check out our online resources. And now I'm open for questions if we still have time.
Questions? Thank you. Do you mind if I give you a mic so she can hear you? Okay. Una, we have one question, so I'm going to walk the mic over. All righty. <laughs> Thank you for the talk and the information. Uh, I have a question so now. Um, the OER is very um, useful and helpful for the students, but now I realize um, Amazon or some other website also have such as um, rent. And then I realized for some textbook, it costs like a hundred, maybe two hundred dollars, but if you rent it, it's only nineteen dollars for a semester. Um, I just wonder if this will be another. <coughs> If this will be another, um, I'm not going to say competitive, but um, which way you think will be the better way for students? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. So, um, yes, um, Amazon and some of the other uh, online vendors um, have been providing rental programs. Um, now, one thing that you want to keep in mind is students may, in fact, want to keep the textbook uh, beyond uh, the time of the um, of the course, and often these online they're digital rentals, and they're good for a semester or so. And unfortunately, as I think those of you who teach with online homework systems with your students as well, the commercial ones, students have access for a semester. Now, if a student fails a course, um, they no longer have access uh, to the materials; they have to repurchase it. Uh, so and that would be true with the rental. If they fail the course and have to retake it, they would have to re-rent the textbook. So OER is available um, online for free. It's available to them indefinitely. Generally, you can download it. The student can also print it themselves. So it is uh, one of the uh, principles of open education is that you can retain the resource um, indefinitely. So from a student perspective, um, I think uh, the OER it offers quite a bit more. Um, but there may be some cases where there isn't an OER textbook and perhaps a rental will be the best other option. So thank you for the question. It's a good one. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another one is, um, I just had it in my mind and then I just jumped off. Should we come back to you? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Is there anyone else out there? Hi, Una. Thank you for your talk. Um, my question is, <clears throat> sorry, um, the, your peer review study showed that only 10% of students reported um, OER texts were worse for their learning. Um, I, was, I was looking at peer review studies last night on um, reading comprehension with digital texts. Um, and just quoting from another peer review study, um, main findings show that students who read texts in print scored significantly better on their reading comprehension than students who read texts digitally. Um, so I, in my classes, and most of my readings are digital, we talk about this, and I have them write things in a notebook um, mm -hmm. and sort of get over this not, mem not, me not being able to remember what they read digitally. Um, so do you have any suggestions or did you want to yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. And I really think it's a faculty choice. OER, um, by its nature, um, well, I would say really all educational materials these days are created digitally, but how you deliver them to students is entirely, I believe, a faculty choice. Um, and um, so many of these textbooks are available in print form as well, and students can print individual pages. So absolutely, you should, um, as a faculty member, make that decision. Now, if the materials you're using aren't available um, in a, in a low-cost print option, so occasionally um, some resources may not be, um, you may want to look at um, using a, a, a Either your print center on campus might be an option, um, or um, there are some online sites like lulu.com, and I, I know that Bianca, I'm sure, could help you with this, but um, where you can post a PDF, and um, students can get very inexpensive print copies through that uh, site. Um, and you, you 
simply post the PDF uh, for free up there and then students can go up there and order one. But for very inexpensive, you know, we're talking like $10 kind of things. Um, but, you know, once again, um, I think whether you deliver to students in a digital format or print or both, even optimally to make it available to students who, you know, um, maybe for some reason are print disabled and need the digital. So I think that's really a faculty choice and then working with your Center for Teaching and Learning and making sure that you can provide the proper resources for your students. So thank you for that question. Maybe time for one more. Thanks, um, I'm back again. So uh, my question is when you, when students register online for the online source, they have to open an account, uh, is that right? Or they can just click the class and then go download well, everything? Yeah, so it, you know, it really depends on, um, I'm going to assume that you're talking about textbooks, so open textbooks. Yeah, open textbook, how they access, they have to have their own account and then they put their personal information in there. Like the, the name and the um, email actually, Yeah, actually that's, you know, so the, the main open textbook publisher is OpenStax. It offers between 25 to 30 um, very high quality um, open textbooks. Um, students can download directly from there. They do not have to create an account. Oh. Uh, faculty uh, can create an account on OpenStax um, if they want to be able to receive the teacher resources. So, you know, I mentioned to you those um, test banks and those PowerPoints. If you want to be able to get a hold of those uh, to teach your course, uh, you need to register as a faculty member because OpenStax doesn't give those away to students. They don't really want the test banks posted on the internet. So, but students can download directly. Um, what many faculty do though actually is they download it and they put it into the LMS for their students if you're using an LMS, but you can also direct the students directly to the website and they don't have to create an account on OpenStax or enter any private information. They can simply read directly from the website or they can download a PDF and um, read it on their desktop. Okay, thanks. Kate, do I answer your questions before we go? Thank you for your presentation. I was interested in this uh, movement and its relationship to publishing companies. And since you've been around so long, I thought maybe you could just comment on that, how that's working or not with publishing companies. Uh, I'm not sure what your question is exactly. Um, how are publishing companies reacting to this? Uh, yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, you know, the publishing companies in the last 10 years um, have been, um, you know, suffering from, you know, kind of a technology revolution. Um, if you look at uh, their revenues, they've been down. Um, open educational resource is really only a part of it. Um, but it's simply that, you know, if you look at the photo industry and what happened with film, um, that's really what's happening with textbooks. Um, and now a number of publishers are looking at um, embracing open educational resources because an open license also allows them to reuse those materials. Um, and there's nothing in the license that prevents that um, if you use the standard license. Um, so uh, you have to be a little careful when um, the publishers get involved in open education, um, but we're, um, you know, we're looking at these, these different business models. They're um, looking at providing additional services beyond the open content. So they're taking OpenStax textbooks, content like that, and uh, they're wrapping it around their services. So, um, you know, obviously they have a, uh, they have a business to run. So you, I would say it's early days in that. Uh, the publishers, um, you know, if, if you'd asked me this question five years ago, the publishers were ranting and raving about OER and talking about how poor the quality was and how terrible students were gonna be doing um, if they used, if faculty used OER in their classrooms. Well, we've got the data that says otherwise now. So they kind of changed their tune and said, oh, okay, well, maybe we can play this game too. So um, 
I'd say that the the uh, the jury's out. Um, I would I would encourage you to be skeptical about the promises of publishers and being open, but I but I wouldn't discount it. Um, you know, there 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 may be. We just have to wait and see what emerges. So thanks for that question. Is it real quick, or because we have to move on to our panel discussion? It's not quick. Okay, so let's just uh, uh, thank Una for her presentation and. and Thank you. Really well, thank you so much for letting me join you this morning. And my email address is on there. So if any questions come up um, afterwards, please feel free to email me and I'd, I'd love to, uh, to talk some more. All right. Well, th thank you again. You're welcome. Have a great day, everyone.